the Zen art of growing Japanese maples. Now, the Japanese are passionate about gardening, and their outdoor obsession has been centered around the maple. Well, that yen for these colorful trees has caught on here, but there is a secret to picking the right variety for your location and climate. I'd like to grow Japanese maple in my yard, and I'd like to know what is the best kind for my area. Well, we certainly think of Japanese maples as delicate and fragile, but they can also be hardy. Scott Paris is here from High Hand Nursery, and they are so popular right now, and I think it's because there are so many varieties that they suit just about every gardener in all parts of the country. People are attracted to the fall color they offer. And they're versatile. Very. All right, you said there are a few questions before you go shopping for Japanese maples that you need to ask. You would ask yourself, do I want a green maple or do I want a red maple? Okay, so that would be depending on your landscaping. Exactly. They come in light green, even darker green. They come in all kinds of shades. Okay. Do I want a broad leaf or do I want a dissectum leaf? So these or are lace lacier, leaf. lighter feeling. Uh huh. These a offer bit more, more shade. Open, airy. Okay. Uh huh. Do I want a upright growing tree or do I want a more classic weeping tree? All right, this would give you shade, actually shade for your garden mm -hmm. or for your patio. This Just one a would little give bit you... taller presence in the garden. Okay. And the last question, which is the biggest question, is where am I going to put this tree? Am I going to put it in the sun or am I going to put it in the shade? Now that's interesting because most of us think that Japanese maples grow only in the shade. Right. Well, the Siryu maple is kind of an oddity. It is a lace leaf tree that takes full sun and heat. Actually, it loves it. And it also offers an extremely bright fall color, very dramatic tree. Well, it's already gorgeous, even in the spring, with this bright green color. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to give you a scenario. Mm -hmm. I want, I have a pretty green landscape, so I'd like something with fall color that's red when it's in, when it's during mm -hmm. the summer. Mm -hmm. And I'd like it to be weepy over a wall. So what I would use is the red dragon. The red dragon is a weeping Japanese maple. It's the new, it's a newer variety. Crimson Queen is the classic variety, and this is just simply an improvement upon that. I love this, Jay. The leaves are long and lacy and just kind of a, we a true weepy type, and this grows in sun. It will acclimate the sun. Okay. So understand if you're committed to having a Japanese maple in the sun with a red dragon, there are certain things you're going to have to go through. Keep it wet. There are products that you can put on it that'll help protect the leaves in the heat. Most Japanese maples should go in the ground, or can we use these just as easily in containers? You can put them by a front door, a porch, or on the deck. If you do put it in the container, get the biggest container you can so that the tree has plenty of time and won't get root bound. So you should keep these well fertilized just like you would any tree or shrub, right? Well, here's the thing about Japanese maples, though. In the heat, we don't fertilize them. Okay. They do not like the nitrogens. It will burn the leaves. Good so, tip. Yes. All so right. we, we fertilize the trees in the nursery. We usually fertilize them in the fall and the early spring. And then we let them grow throughout the season. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Some great information. If you need Scott's four tips or any other information on Japanese maples, log on to our website at DIYNetwork.com. These uh, need not be limited to the usual but inedible or fruitless flowering cherries and crab apples. There's a lot of fruit trees that actually provide food and beauty. One such tree is the pawpaw. Here's a branch of the pawpaw. You can see the leaves look lush and almost tropical, but the plant is hardy in the Northeast. In the fall, the leaves turn a beautiful clear yellow. And there's other fruit trees that do these, the same thing also, including Juneberry, Cornelian Cherry, Medlar. So plant these trees and you can have your cake and eat it too. Putting annuals and vegetables in in the spring in the Midwest is a tricky proposition. Here's what you need. You need a little local knowledge, some investigative skills, and some patience. You also need to know your hardiness zone, which in the Midwest can run from 3A to 7B. Then you need to know the last frost-free date, and that's a, a, an average because it's never the same each year. So check with your local extension service or the library. You also need to know the other factors that might affect you, like are you near a lake, are you near a big city, is there a hill, or something like that. Finally, check the weather reports because if a cold snap hits, you're gonna have to be ready to protect your vegetables. So even if that doesn't work for you, don't say I didn't warn you. I wonder what my hardiness zone is. Oh look, there's a map right here. Coming up next, risky gardening business. People give me things and say, I challenge you to grow this, and most of the time I do. <laughs> Plants in your garden to help out the soil, is that true? 
Well, farmers certainly rotate crops, so it makes sense for us to do the same. New plants bring new life to soil and to your gardening skills. Now, if you feel you're in a planting rut and planting the same thing over and over again, why not take a page from Betsy Heights planting plan? She's a master gardener on a mission. Take on any challenge from her neighbors and grow anything. She wanted right me here. to plant the stamens. Well, who knows what a stamen is? I don't think the stamens are going to work, Norma. <laughs> Call it the duel in the dirt, a backyard bet, the wager of the wildflowers. <laughs> Neighbors Norma and Betsy have turned gardening into the great game. <laughs> People give me things and say, I challenge you to grow this, and most of the time I do. I challenge Betsy to grow lilies from a seed. I bet you can't grow artichokes because this weather's nothing like the coastal region. I challenged Betsy to grow raspberries, which she was told she couldn't grow in Wilton, but she has. That's zero for Wilton, California, and another win for Betsy Height, AKA the Challenge Gardener. Being a strong woman and being challenged, she wants to prove that she's right and you're wrong. Oh, a baby! The second crop of artichokes. But they can't grow here. Don't tell the plants. Raised with the love of the outdoors, gardening, and cooking. Let's do something fun with these raspberries. Betsy blends these interests into being the best backyard gardener on the block. But you can't grow them here, Norma. No. How does she do it? And how can you harness this gift of the green thumb? Betsy has a wheelbarrow full of tips. Raised beds and imported soil, not imported from a foreign country, but imported from um, a, a good landscaping company. My beds actually have about five yards of dirt in each of them, and then the compost that I get from a local equestrian farm. Her recipe for success? A mixture of horse manure, wood shavings and dirt, and a fertilizer plan that's done weekly. It's Fertilizer Friday, and I swear the plants look forward to it. Hand watering allows Betsy to get up close and personal with her plants, but she also has an irrigation system that, especially in the warmer months, is turned on for up to two hours. It's very, very important to deep water your plants so that those roots could get encouraged to go all the way down as far as they can possibly go. And speaking of encouragement... Any given evening in February, I'll be out in the greenhouse planting and talking to the plants and feeding them. And, and then usually by the 1st of April, when everybody else is headed out to the garden store, I'm putting my plants in the garden. Another tip, why not add a little music to the garden? One of Betsy's winning ways to keep the greens growing. And these wonderful little free CDs are a terrific way to keep the birds out of the raspberries. The shiny reflection scares the birds away. Apparently they're working and Betsy's moving on. This is my newest challenge thanks to my neighbor Norma. Um, she challenged me before to grow lilies from seed and now she's challenged me to grow gladiolus from seed so I am just drying these guys out and hoping that I can find a seed pod somewhere in there. Betsy's other garden goal? To encourage others to think outside their comfort zones and garden zones and reap the sweet rewards. Stop next time at the nursery and pick something out that they've never seen before, they've never heard of before, and see if they can grow it. I mean, it's, it's really fun to take a little four inch pot and have it turn into a million raspberries. Well, Betsy's a real expert at it, but whether you're a master gardener or just a little green around the edges, part of the fun of gardening is challenging yourself by trying something new. A good place to start? Tomatoes. Now, many of us have grown those red varieties like Better Boy and Early Girl. These are heirloom tomatoes. They come in all different sizes, shapes, and colors. And as the name implies, they are heirlooms. They've been passed down, the seeds have, from generations of farmers. Now, these may be even more treasured in some cases than family antiques. Now they're just tomatoes, so they need eight hours of sunlight. They do need consistent watering and a really good organically amended soil. 
Tomatoes like these can grow anywhere in the country, but you might check with your local county extension office for varieties that grow best where you are. There's even a variety called the San Francisco Fog. And as you might think, that is a variety that grows in that cold, windy city. So even gardeners there get some summer tomatoes. So you know there's something for everybody. Just plant three or four different types. You'll get some fruit. And then you'll be the envy of your neighbors and friends. The only trick is that you've got to pick them and eat them. And I don't think that's anything any of us will have trouble with. Here's the dirt on cutting roses. After all that hard work in the garden, you got to have something to show off. So here's how to get that perfect bouquet to last. First, cut roses in the early morning or late afternoon. Be sure and bring a bucket of water to collect the roses. And search for blooms that aren't fully open. About one-third to halfway there, those will last longer. Once inside, pour a little lemon-lime soda in a bucket of water and submerge the stems. Then cut another inch off the bottom at a slant and remove any leaves that'll be underwater. And finally, place your vase in a cool, dark area for a couple of hours to let them adjust. It's a little more work, but aren't your roses worth it? Up next, starting your spring seeds. With so many seeds to choose from, what do you do? Seed containers. What are some other alternatives for planting seeds? Well, springtime is certainly the right time to start growing from seed, but some seeds may need just a little head start before you put them in the ground. And you can use a variety of seed pots for that. Think of seeds as a parent. Everything you give these little guys, they're going to absorb. So you want to make sure they go to good home right from the beginning. This is the most common and probably the easiest. They're peat pots. You're going to fill them with soil, and then once the seedling is sprouted, the whole thing goes into the ground. The same thing applies to this little pop-up peat pot. They come flat like this. You add some water, and then you would put the seed. That would also go in the ground. These are great because they act like little blankets around your seed and keep them uh, going strong right when they do that transplant. Now, these are plastic pots, and these are like the six-pack cell packs that you get in nursery. You get plants like this. Simply plant these. You'll miss them, and then put the water in the tray. The plant will then steal the water from the tray, and that'll keep them nice and watered before you get them in the ground. These are certainly something you can use. These are handy, and you have them around the house. Biodegradable and also recyclable. These are egg cartons. Just punch a hole in them, pull them apart, and they go in the ground once the seedling has sprouted. These paper pots, you've got a little extra time. These work great. Most newspapers now do not use uh, toxic ink. So these are non-toxic. You would just roll them up. They come out looking like this. You squash the bottom. These will hold together just long enough to get them into the ground. I use a wood flat that looks a lot like this. I sprinkle seed over it, water it, and then when they're ready, I just lift them out with a fork. Well, if you still have questions about starting from seed, here's Master Gardener Fred Hoffman. He's digging a little deeper so you don't have to. The great part about starting a garden from seed, all the wonderful, beautiful, hard to find varieties that you're not gonna find growing in a nursery. It's fun and it's easy. Let's go plant some seeds. The hard part is you deciding what to plant. With so many seeds to choose from, what do you do? Well, one thing you do is follow the instructions on the back of the packet. Everything you need to know is right there, including instructions for starting the seeds early. Like these hollyhocks, they need about a four to five week head start to get off to a good start. So what's the best way to start those seeds? How about in a peat pot? The great part about using peat pots, once a plant gets up to this size, you can stick this whole thing in the ground and not worry about touching the roots. But before you can get a plant to this size, you have to start the seeds. And one of the best ways to start seeds is using a seed starting mix. A seed starting mix contains vermiculite, perlite, peat moss, compost. It's a great inert formula that contains no weed seeds and no nematodes and nothing nasty that you might find in your own garden soil. It's great stuff to start seeds in. Now, the question is, how deep do you plant those seeds? 
Plant seeds no deeper than the seed is long. These melon seeds, for example, are about a half inch long, and that's the depth to which we're gonna plant them. Just use your finger and poke them down about a half inch. We're gonna keep the seeds evenly moist. You may need to water them every day. Now, where do you put all these peat pots so that the seeds get off to a great start? They love a sunny, warm environment. A sunny kitchen windowsill works great, but maybe you don't have a place in the house that's like that. Well, you can do it outdoors in a sunny location, but put them in what's called a propagation box. It's got a clear lid on it that lets the sun in and it keeps it more humid. And if where you live is really cold at night, you could pick up this whole container and move it indoors. And one great thing, seeds don't need fertilizer to get started. You don't have to fertilize these until they get two to four sets of leaves on them. Well, we've got our seeds sprouting in the propagation box. And now we've got all these leftover seeds. What can we do with them? You want them to last three to five years? Store them right. Keep them in their original containers, put them in a paper bag, and then slip them in the coolest, driest place in your house, under your bed. Don't store them in plastic. They can overheat that way. There's just so many wonderful seed varieties available. You can get unusual vegetables, beautiful flowers, red hot peppers, and all these varieties are waiting for you at a seed rack or catalog just close by. Yeah, I've never tried these before. Hmm. Here's the real dirty work to keep your flowers fresh. While home brewed treatments like adding bleach, aspirin, or sugar to base water may be an urban gardening legend, studies show that some commercial products do keep your flowers fresh almost twice as long. Still to come, here's how you do it. Bought a kit, built a six by eight greenhouse that's been working out really well. We've been hearing from the experts, now it's your turn because you're the master gardener when it comes to your own backyard. What works for you may also work for someone else. Take a look. Hi, Edmund Blagden, Sacramento, California. I've been growing orchids for about 15 years now, just as a hobby. I'm not in competitions or anything, but Sacramento gets way too hot for orchids normally. So we built a greenhouse, bought a kit, built a six by eight greenhouse that's been working out really well. Um, and basically the orchids have their best conditions now and they are thriving. It's got built in um, thermostats for both heating and cooling. And I come out here every day and spray them down. It's an automatic mister system as well. Keeps them all uh, nicely hydrated and the humidity up high because they like that as well. Anybody that likes orchids and you live in harsh environments such as real, real heat and real uh, cold climates, greenhouses are um, essential and that's about it. Hi, I'm Mary and uh, this is my garden. I love to collect chickens and roosters and little pigs. They uh, remind me of my childhood in Portugal. They uh, just make me very happy and I collect them here and there at flea markets. Well, is this what the leaves on your rose bush look like? Something's been dining on them and enjoying it. Now, some of this doesn't bother me. Your garden is a network of insect and plant life. There's beneficial insects and there are bad insects, and they can all live together. But when they become a problem and they actually harm the overall health of your plant, then they need to be addressed. The first way of dealing with this is to find out what's eating your plants. So you need to be a little bit of a plant detective. One of the easiest ways to do that is to look at your plant. This is being chewed on all the leaves at the top have been cut off if you look underneath the leaf there's the culprit this is a snail problem there's also another snail on the plant if you walk up to the plant and things fly away that's possibly white fly or if you don't see anything at all that may be another indication that there's something hiding in the soil that could be earwigs or even some cutworms which can be very damaging generally two types of insects those that chew and munch away at your leaves and others that suck the nutrients out of the leaves themselves the most common is of course slug and snails now slug and snails live in really moist uh, environments so during the winter and spring months they're prevalent but now with our irrigation 
practices. We water overnight and these come out overnight and do the most damage by the time you wake up in the morning. You can certainly see the damage they've done. They leave a slimy silvery trail. You can see that. You can look at the irregular chewing habits on this hosta leaf, for example. Other chewing insects, earwigs. That was the problem with the rose bush. These are pretty even cuts. They're like half moons. And you know what an earwig is? It's that pincher bug, and they eat their way through the plants. They don't necessarily damage the stalk of it, but they will eat the leaves, which of course is where we need to get the nutrients to the plant. In addition to that, there are worms, and worms can be extremely dangerous. Worms can cut off the plant right where the plant meets the soil. This is a to tomato hornworm, and this will obviously eat the tomatoes as well as aid in the decline of the overall tomato plant. And cutworms live in the soil, so we don't always see those. So now that we've determined that it's a chewing insect, you also need to decide whether it could be a sucking insect. Look at how this leaf is modeled. It's got varying degrees of green. That's because if you look on the back of a leaf, again, just physical examination, you'll see that there are little bugs on the back. I even have one of my detective devices here where you can look really up close to see exactly what type of pest you're dealing with. So now that we've determined whether it's a chewing or sucking insect that's causing some problems in our garden, now let's talk about ways to solve those problems. Is there a way to organically treat slugs? Yes, there are plenty of ways to deal with slugs and snails organically, and I recommend that. The easiest way of doing this is to simply hand pick them and put them in a tub of uh, water that has a little bit of detergent in it. That takes care of them immediately. Many of us have other home tricks. One that seems to be very popular and works great, a pie tin in the garden at night, pour a little beer in it. Slugs and snails are attracted to the yeast in the beer. As far as caterpillars are concerned, praying mantis love caterpillars, but those are beneficial insect that may or may not be in your garden. Otherwise, you can use some organic sprays, put water with a little bit of detergent, and use any one of these products, hot pepper spray, garlic, or onions. They're repelled by the scent of those. Aphids, you can hose those off with a good garden sprayer or even use an insecticidal soap. Beneficial insects are fabulous in our gardens, and they take care of a lot of our work. In the case of a rose bush, ladybugs and thrips just go together great. We'll let them make their home on that rose bush. Now, if all else fails, there's an old gardening adage that said, go ahead and plant one for the bugs and one for you. That way we're all happy. Now, if you missed any of our pest information today, you can log on to our website at DIYNetwork.com. Now, here's a tip for your home turf. If the apples in your southern fruit orchard look like this, the reason is this critter. And this critter came from this critter, the codling moth. And springtime's the best time to control it. Codling moths spent the winter around the bark of your trees. They emerge in early spring when the nighttime temperatures are about 62 degrees. And then they start laying eggs. The eggs then hatch, the larvae burrow into the fruit where they grow and grow, and then they slither back out go down the tree and become a moth again, and that cycle can happen four times a year. To control the coddling moth, do it now. Step number one is to clean up all fallen fruit and any branches that may have fallen. Do that throughout the year. That's one way to control the coddling moth. The second step is put out coddling moth traps. Not only will they trap the moth, they also let you know that there are little worms crawling into your fruit. And that brings us to step three. Pick off any fruit where you see holes in it. And by thinning out the fruit, getting rid of the coddling moth worms, you're gonna make the rest of your fruit in your fruit trees even bigger and better in your southern fruit orchard. Coming up next, he's crazy for gardening. If it says, amaze your neighbors, I'll buy it. In this garden, looks can be deceiving. This is a detura flower. It's a common weed in this area. Simple blooms may be what you expect from this quiet, mild-mannered gardener, but don't be fooled. There was an article in the local paper describing me as the loose seed in the packet. A trip to Tony Lord, a.k.a. the eclectic gardener's place, is a horticultural walk on the wild side. This is one of the oddities in the tomato family. It's uh, Solanum cassianum. From the thorny 
This is a bitter melon. To the sweet. This is my sugarcane plantation. Tony has a way with the weird. And that innocent weed, it's actually a hallucinogenic. Apparently, you get an illusion that you're flying. And it's been linked to witches in uh, Mexico. <laughs> It's said that the Chinese used the seed to pack dishes in China when they shipped it. Years ago, as a social anthropologist, Tony spent time in Micronesia and has a soft spot for the relationship between nature and people. Oh yes, I'm a seed freak. Much of the madness in his yard starts from old-fashioned seeds. Find a good seed catalog. Uh, you need to adjust somewhat to your climate. I grow some exotics and then I have to try and keep them alive. I don't have a greenhouse, so I put some in my garage by a window and then I bring some in the house. Pineapple, ginger, and bamboo that's run wild give Tony his island fix. But he's also trying to grow a cup of joe. This is a small coffee tree. Uh, lives in a north window, a very nice house plant. Uh, easy to grow, doesn't seem to be too demanding. And who knew? These meat-eating plants, or Saracenia, are low care too, only requiring distilled water and a few snacks here and there. Once in a while, I'll put a rotting tomato over here to attract some fruit flies for them. From the gory to the glamorous, Tony's front yard boasts such exotics as this princess tree. The story is in China, in the old days, People would plant a tree when their daughter was born. And when she was 15 or time to get married, they would cut the tree and make her sort of hope chest out of the wood because it grew so fast. When his own daughter was growing up, Tony tracked her height with what else? A peculiar plant. She's pictured here next to a tower of jewels. And speaking of family, do they appreciate his passion for odd plants? Not entirely. They like the pretty flowers if I manage to get some pretty flowers and they would like more landscaping. Tony also spends a lot of time keeping track of things. What I found useful since I plant usually several hundred seeds varieties every year is to keep notes on uh, I use four by six cards alphabetically by the scientific name. Descriptions and details also go on the card. It's a good way to distinguish the elephant flower from the dancing ladies or penny pies. And while this may seem a tad eccentric to you, there's a method to his madness. It's how Tony determines what wild and wacky things should be planted next. One thing I've always done is go through the seed catalogs and if it says, amaze your neighbors, I'll buy it. Well, Tony Lord does grow some neglected things in his backyard, but his story should really encourage all of us to not be afraid of trying the unknown, or in this case, growing the unknown. And it can be pretty simple, like planting ginger. Tony recommends that we just buy this in the produce section at the grocery store. You could just poke some toothpicks or skewers in it, like we did that avocado seed all those years. plant fruit trees in it. Do I have to have an orchard for something like that? It is possible to grow fruit trees in any setting and in any space backyard. Once you purchase the tree, it's the management of the tree that's important and pruning techniques. Ed Livo is here, a fruit tree specialist, and this is your area of expertise. Many fruit trees are available, of course, throughout the country. Apples, very common. Can we plant any of these trees in a small space without sure. problems? Absolutely. Any, any, any variety of fruit tree can be planted in high-density plantings. All you have to do is use the right pruning techniques to keep the size under control. All right. Now, it's a good idea when you select a tree to go to your local nursery to see varieties that grow best in your region, Absolutely. first of all. And then you're going to pick a tree. You can pick them bare root, like these trees, or you can pick some that have been found in containers in the nursery. Sure, bare root trees give you the best selection because between January and April, that's when the, the delivery is made to all the, the, uh, the nurseries. But after the uh, bare root season, everything that remains is containerized and then available to the public afterwards. 
All right, once you get the tree, you've got to plant it. Now we put this in a raised bed to show you, but this is also a good way to plant it even in a landscape situation. Oh, in a situation. poor draining soil, absolutely. This, this is the absolute way to plant it if you have poor drainage and determine that you, um, uh, the only location in your yard to plant is poor drainage. All right, there are rules of thumb. For example, the crown needs to be just above, right, just above right the soil at line. the soil line, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, and and that, that, of course, is where the soil line meets the root system and usually that can be determined pretty easily just by looking at the tree. Yeah, because these have been grafted. You're buying the rootstock. Absolutely, and the rootstock is an important consideration. All right, now these are apple trees. They're short. <laughs> yes. And this is one of the reasons that I think many of us find growing fruit trees a problem. Right. This is how I would grow or purchase a fruit tree. And already any fruit coming off of this is taller than I can reach and handle. And I would say that this tree right here is probably not suitable for any purpose and really needs to be trained correctly as it is, let alone for this high density planting that we're, uh, we're utilizing here. I know you have a rule of thumb. Now the rule of thumb is never <laughs> ever let your trees get any taller than this. And tall people have tall trees, short people have short trees, and my trees are all this tall. All right, and they're, uh, they can be older trees and still be managed even at that height, but it starts when they're young. Yes, absolutely. And, and at, at, when, you, when you first plant the tree, you want to take and cut it off somewhere right around the knee. And this, this uh, pruning situation will give you the opportunity to take and utilize a technique like high density planting where you can take and enjoy more fruit from a, from a um, smaller space. This is a unique situation. Most of us would think of planting and spacing these anywhere from six to ten feet apart, but you have put them all together. Right, and if you're not looking for commercial quantities of fruit and you're not looking for commercial sized fruit trees in your yard, then of course a technique like this is just ideal. This is how many of us purchase a tree. What do we do with that when we get it home? Well, if you're planting in a high density uh, situation like we have here, then of course the uh, object is to have all the trees balanced. And so we would take and just yeah. whack this one off completely, balance it out with the rest of the planting. All right. Does this mean all the fruit is gone for this year? Of course obviously. it does. Yes. yes. Yeah, there's no. And, and really, we're in a construction mode, if you will, now. These trees are going to develop nice, bushy canopies, bushes, if you will. And we'll maintain the center open, but we'll create a nice canopy of fruit, which ripens all at different times. Now, earlier we saw that the canopy started at about five to six feet. Sure. Now your canopy is going to start at a manageable height and only grow this high. Absolutely. This high, or if you choose, you can grow it a little higher, but any height that you determine. I like it there myself. And this variety earlier, of course, wouldn't work at all in a situation like this. Well, this is a great opportunity for all of us to grow more than just one fruit tree yes. in our landscape. It truly is. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Here's the real dirt on creating garden illusions. We're talking mere madness. Let your garden be the frame. Your small garden will burst from its seams with this one simple addition. A mirror against the fence becomes a window or even a door to a secret garden. Mirrors on the ground become serene reflecting pools. Add some movement by hanging them from branches and watch the light dance as the wind blows. One thing's for sure, they'll make sure you and your garden are looking great. Still to come, we turn the cameras on you. I said plant these in the ground. They'll grow great tomatoes. I'm Tara Coombs from Fair Oaks, California. And I have a tip for you. A friend of mine gave me some dried tomatoes from her previous gardening season and said, plant these in the ground. They'll grow great tomatoes. I was a rookie gardener and said, that sounds easy enough. So I planted them in the ground. And the tomatoes that came were the absolute most delicious, my favorite tomatoes. I thought it was a great idea since some of the tomatoes in our garden were just so-so. We picked our favorite tomatoes, desiccated them, dried them in the refrigerator, in this open container on a paper towel, several varieties that were our favorites. And so next season, we'll have all our favorite tomatoes, not just our so-so tomatoes. Earlier, we heard from a viewer who was concerned about her mother's obsession with garden art. I generally like my gardens and landscape to be fairly simple, but I have to confess that I also have eclectic taste when it comes to bird baths. 
I have lots of them. I love them because of the structure in the garden. I love the fact that there's movement as the birds come and go. But instead of placing them all out at one time, I tend to rotate them in and out. I enjoy them one at a time. And that way, don't interfere with the beauty and the simplicity of the garden. So you might consider that as well with other garden ornaments. That's my dirt on gardening. If you have questions about anything from this show or would like to submit a question or a tip for a future show, log on to our website at DIYNetwork.com. I'm Christine Hansen. We'll see you next time.